General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. What comes to mind when you think of Mikhail Gorbachev? His birthmark? His place in history? Maybe you're like me and your introduction to him was through The Simpsons when he came to Springfield to visit George H.W. Bush with a coffee maker. Gorbachev is a controversial figure. Did he end the Cold War or did he destroy the Soviet Union? Didn't he kind of do both? I wanted to have this episode out in June before I went on vacation, but it ended up being so much heavy lifting, and it really needed to be treated carefully without self-inflicting pressure to get it done, that I wanted to take this one slow. Not to mention, there is more science in this episode than any that have come before. This is the story of the KGB's downfall, or rather, the the ship crumbling around them until they were more or less powerless to reverse the inevitable collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. We've seen the trajectory of Soviet Stuka police from the red-bannered gangs of the Cheka, to the brutal efficiency of the NKVD, to the clandestine omnipresence of the KGB. In this episode, we won't focus on KGB spycraft as much as information control. If you want the deets on KGB history and methods, listen to the previous episodes, part 6, 7, 8, and 9. Today, we are concerned with wrapping up the tale of the KGB and exploring their dissolution, going down with the Soviet ship. Before we get started, follow my socials at Secret Police Podcasts on Instagram or at hush underscore popo on Twitter. It'll help you stay out of the clutches of the KGB. Here we go. In this 10th edition of Russian Secret Police, we'll dive into the KGB's downfall, the unraveling of the Soviet Union, and the atypical leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev. We'll see how Gorbachev rose from life as a farm boy to the Kremlin's communist throne. We'll discover how the KGB reacted to losing power and the final gasps of its security state in the face of Chernobyl, Glasnost, and Perestroika. Who was Mikhail Gorbachev? How did the KGB try to survive? How did the Soviet Union dissolve? What is the problem with the type of nuclear reactor used at Chernobyl? You're listening to the Secret Police Podcast. Do you have a problem with authority? Because I do, and I'm on a mission to help us build a healthy skepticism towards those in power. My name is Jack, and I spend hours researching and engaging with my morbid curiosity of dictatorships to share with you the history and the methods of the world's most brutal secret police forces. We look at how secret police enforce tyranny and strike fear in their people. Let's recap. Last episode, we saw Leonid Brezhnev come to power from humble origins, riding on both Khrushchev's coattails and Khrushchev's mistakes into the role of general secretary. Brezhnev temporarily governed as part of a troika alongside Alexei Kosygin and Nikolai Podgorny. Over the next 10 years, Brezhnev forced these two colleagues into retirement and became the Soviet Union's sole leader. Yuri Andropov was appointed KGB chairman who unleashed the KGB upon the Soviet people in a wave of increased domestic repression. The KGB infiltrated domestic dissident groups and foreign governments and supported North Vietnamese intelligence. They assisted the Bulgarian state security to assassinate Georgi Markov with a ricin-tipped umbrella and laid the groundwork for the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Communists and the KGB were the geopolitical boogeyman that haunted American nightmares. The 1980s saw resurgent fears of nuclear war when a Soviet fighter plane shot down Korean Airlines 007, killing 269 people, including a member of US Congress. Brezhnev fell ill with multiple conditions until his death in 1982. Yuri Andropov was elected general secretary and died 15 months later. He was succeeded by Konstantin Chernenko, who died 13 months later. 
It was an example of why nations should avoid government by geriatrics. Waiting in the party's wings for his shot at general secretary was Mikhail Gorbachev, a man who reportedly had a dogmatic sense of right and wrong to his detriment, but a man who was eager to change things in the Soviet Union. Gorbachev approached steering the Soviet ship differently, but the Soviet system went into self-preservation mode when faced with certain radioactive challenges. And the KGB wasn't about to take Gorbachev's reforms laying down. So let's get to know Mikhail Gorbachev. Mikhail Sergeyevich Gorbachev was born in the village called Pogorny in the Stavropol region of Russia on the 2nd of March, 1931. Stavropol is an open steppe with vast plains and open skies. Honestly, there are places like that here in southern and western Minnesota. Provolny is still to this day a rural farming community as it was in the 30s. And this town is also closer to Tbilisi, Georgia than it is to Moscow within that corridor of Russia between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Young Mikhail was f- the firstborn to Sergei Andreevich Gorbachev and Maria Pantele- Panteleevna Gorbachev. In interviews with Gorbachev's friends, they said Maria always kept their modest house spotless and the family kept some kind of uh, poultry or ducks. Sergei was a driver and, and a mechanic and was a generous man and eager to teach young people how to drive. Sergei and Maria encouraged Mikhail to study hard in school, much like Brezhnev's parents did to him, but fewer beatings than Stalin's. More education, fewer beatings, better kids. You get it. Young Mikhail went to a local school in Provolny and was adored by his teachers. He stood out as the teacher's pet. (laughs) Whatever, nerd. But Mikhail was a likable uh, nerd. Peers of the young boy Mikhail, who attended school with him in 1938, described him as mature beyond his years and very bright. And it was so nice in the research for this episode that interviews from still exist about um, Provolny and the Gorbachevs as a family and what Mikhail was like as a young boy. This was definitely something that was not available to me for really any of the previous Russian leadership. Those sorts of those sorts of things in terms of interviews from people who knew them, who knew the person or the family, it just didn't exist. So this was certainly a breath of fresh air. So anyway... Mikhail's childhood wasn't all academic studies and the quiet farm life. God, no. Far from it. This is the 1930s in Russia. It's not a place you wanted to be. If you've listened to this show up to this point, you know. The Soviet Union was ensnared by the secret police and Stalin's purges. One third of Mikhail's village were killed during the terror. And another thing I'd just like to comment on is how pervasive Stalin was within the Soviet Union. Like, yes, he was the leader during a time of great change. And I know that we discarded uh, we discarded him in episode five, but it's it's difficult to talk about the other general secretaries without talking about Stalin because he played such a big part in their lives as well as the lives of many people in, at the beginning of the Cold War. The terror crept into Gorbachev's family as well. Mikhail's maternal grandfather was arrested in 1934, and the paternal grandfather was arrested in 37. Both served time in the gulags, and the maternal grandfather, a man named Pateli Gapkalo, was tortured by the then OGPU. It's been a while since we last talked about these guys. The Joint State Political Directorate, or OGPU, were Stalin's secret police from 1929 until 1934, when they were re- rebranded the People's Commissariat for, or, or uh, of Internal Affairs, or NKVD. What's interesting is that Gorbachev's biography by William Taub- Taubman said OGPU, but the documentary that I watched about Gorbachev implied that the grandfather was tortured in 1937, which would have been after the OGPU was rebranded into the NKVD. So just an interesting discrepancy there. But the bottom line is that somebody tortured Mikhail's grandfather, and they beat the crap out of him. Gorbachev himself said in an interview, they tried to break his arms, and they put him on a stove. They tried to blind him. So it's really something that undermined his strength. He died rather young. My god, a stove? 
I imagine they tried to break Grandpa Gorby by searing his palms or his face. And maybe he said, hey, flip me over. I'm done on this side. No. Uh, many of Provolny's purge survivors had stories of torture and murder by the secret police, but they, for some reason, had no idea uh, Stalin was the man behind their suffering until Khrushchev spilled the tea. About the purges, uh, Gorbachev said, frankly, we didn't know anything. We, we really didn't know much. Even what our own family had to go through. I totally trusted my grandfather. I always believed what he said. And even he used to say, well, Stalin had nothing to do with those crimes. He never blamed the Soviet state or Stalin. Mikhail was just a boy witnessing the violence and brutality of the Soviet state imposed on his people. Then came Nazi Germany's invasion in 1941, when Mikhail was just 10 years old. Provolny was under German occupation for a time as well. 800 people were drafted from Provolny to fight, including Papa Gorby, Sergei. By the war's end, only about 400 made it back. None of them were the same. Some were made mentally uh, destitute. The Gorbachev, the Gorbachev family lost relatives, but Sergei fortunately made it back home, and I have to wonder if Sergei did any depraved acts to survive, and if he did, if he ever told Mikhail such stories. And this kind of reminds me of, uh, within my own family, my great-grandfather, uh, Francis Frith, he was a British officer in the trenches in France, specifically the first or second battle of, um, I'm not going to say this correct, but it's this town in Belgium called the, uh, Ips, Ipsa. Um, my grandmother told me once that apparently he used to have nightmares for the rest of his life uh, from his time in the war. And I believe that. When Sergei returned to Provolny, he and young Mikhail set to work harvesting their fields. I've never even served, and I wonder about how much of a shock it must uh, be to return home from a war, especially such a tectonic conflict like that between the Soviets and the Nazis, just to go back to normal and carry on. Sergei sounds like a badass who showed his son hard work and treated him with respect. I hereby award medals of outstanding fatherhood to all the good father agents out there. When Mikhail was 14, he joined the Communist Youth League, Komsomol, and he was awarded the Order of the Red Banner. His parents also had their second child, Alexander Gorbachev, in 1947. Yet, yeah, Mikhail and Alexander were nearly 17 years apart. And according to a 1995 New York Times article, Alexander has stayed, or at least at that time, had stayed out of his brother's limelight. He wasn't mentioned much in any of Mikhail's biographies at the time either. And... Also in 1995, it looked like he worked for the Russian military's general staff in Moscow. This article is obviously dated, so I'm not sure what Alexander does now, or if he is even alive. Um, however, if you do look him up, you might stumble, stumble upon a different Alexander Gorbachev, who has no relation to the former general secretary, but who does own Foss Agro, Europe's largest producer of phosphate-based fertilizer. This Alexander was granted asylum in England following an, associate, an, an associate's in, um, involvement in some ambiguous and politically motivated crimes back in 2005. I don't know what the charges were, just an interesting tidbit here. In 1950, Gorbachev finished school and traveled to Moscow to study law. Earning that Red Banner Medal helped uh, Mikhail secure a spot in school. He entered a different world in Moscow. A whole galaxy is more of a metropolitan lifestyle than harvesting grain. At 19, he stood out as a rural boy in an oversized suit, one individual and future leader in a city that was wrestling with global conflict, considered the context of Mikhail's arrival to Moscow. The war ended five years prior, and temperatures rose between Cold War superpowers. Stalin was probably at the height of his power and cult of personality. This was a time when Beria would have been skulking around Moscow streets, preying on young girls. Mikhail was in for a bit of a culture shock. In 1952, Gorbachev joined the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. He believed in the communist ideals proclaimed by the party of Lenin and Stalin, but a few times Mikhail stuck his neck out for his friends. Check this out. Mikhail and another student wrote a formal letter of complaint about a lecturer who apparently, rather than 
give a proper lecture and teach, recited Stalin's latest works. It was the equivalent of reading word for word from the slides. A friend of Mikhail's, a man named Vladimir Lieberman, said, The note ran, You're lecturing at a university. The people in this room have secondary education. They can read. Oof. Uh, guys, you, you may not want to protest the commie-appointed professor. It's not like he was standing there reading from the Kama Sutra pop-up book. These are Stalin's mustachioed works. Well, Mikhail didn't care. However, for this letter, the system corrected his transgression, and Mikhail was publicly reprimanded, but not physically or Siberianly harmed. Mikhail met the love of his life, a woman named... Raisa Maximovna Titorenko. She helped Country Boy over here assimilate to Moscow culture. They started their friendship as just that, but it grew into a romantic relationship. So maybe even you can get out of the friend zone. What I find interesting is that people who knew Raisa said that she was an Orthodox communist through and through. Yet similar to Mikhail's purge experience, her grandfather was executed by Stalin's regime. Mikhail seemed to be doing well for himself, but his one downfall was himself and his dogmatic sense of moral right and wrong. Not exactly an irredeemable quality, quite admirable to me, but not admirable to the Stalinist system. Meanwhile, Stalin was in the Kremlin, looking around at all the Soviet Union's most competent doctors, and said, Oh boy, here I go killing again. In 1953, Stalin initiated a second purge called the Doctor's Plot. Going back to 1948 for a moment, one of Stalin's close associates, a man named Andrei Zhdanov, a Communist Party leader and essentially the Minister of Culture, died that August. He died of heart failure, which will be important here in a moment. According to the Mayo Clinic, heart failure, also called congestive heart failure, is when your heart muscle fails to pump the necessary volume of blood demanded by the body. This can occur because of narrow arteries or high blood pressure, and gradually your heart becomes too fatigued to function. Lifestyle changes such as exercise, reducing sodium, managing stress, and reducing alcohol consumption reduces the risk of heart failure. However, I doubt these lifestyle changes were possible as one of Stalin's underlings. Several of Zhdanov's colleagues, including Stalin, noted his drinking problem. Then in 1953, Stalin caught wind that the doctors treating Zhdanov may have prescribed the wrong medication, and I don't know what medication was standard for heart failure in the Soviet Union at that time. So I don't know if what they prescribed exacerbated Zhdanov's condition or not. Whatever the case, Stalin interpreted this mishap as a plot by Kremlin physicians to murder uh, top Soviet officials. Fifteen of the top Soviet physicians, including Stalin's own personal physician, Dr. Vinogradov, were arrested and tortured in order to extract names of other officials they supposedly planned to murder. The officials who weren't named were purged because Stalin feared an internal conspiracy to take power. Furthermore, Many of the Soviet Union's best doctors were Jewish, and a wave of, of Stalinist-style anti-Semitism swept the country. Vladimir Lieberman, who we heard a quote from regarding the complaint about the lecturer, was a target of this anti-Jewish repression. Gorbachev's principles were big, but his balls were bigger, and he stood up for Lieberman in altercations with officials. Fortunately for both of them, Stalin died in March of 1953. Mikhail mourned the death of Stalin, and later that fall, he and Raisa got married, and they both graduated in 1955. They left Moscow to travel back to Stavropol City. He hoped to work as a lawyer, but eventually gave, up for, gave that dream up for a party position as first secretary for the city branch of Komsomol. Mikhail and Raisa had their first child, or first and only child, Irina, in 1957. While Mikhail was putting around in his career in Stavropol, the Soviet Union was exerting its power in Eastern Europe and, and getting entrenched in conflict with the West. In 1970, Mikhail became the party head of the Stavropol region. Now, how the heck did he even get on the, tra on the trajectory to ultimate power? Stavropol had a resort district popular with government leaders. 
Mikhail rubbed shoulders with these people and cultivated a good reputation. The most powerful of those leaders was Yuri Andropov. Remember him? The head of the KGB? Andropov often visited the spas to treat his diabetes. Despite being the number one party boss in Stavropol and ambitious, Mikhail seemed like a down-to-earth guy, somebody you'd want to have a vodka with. On one occasion, Raisa was late to her teaching job and forgot her breakfast in the rush to make it to work. Her students were shocked as they watched Mikhail Gorbachev knock on the classroom door and deliver his wife's food himself. He didn't send an errand boy to do it for him. The Gorbachevs appeared to not let their daughter Irina uh, use the privileges of her father's position to gain unfair advantage. I can't say it never happened. Uh, I can say I watched interviews with people claiming the Gorbachevs were a modest family based on their own experiences interacting with the Gorbachevs. The Gorbachevs remained in Stavropol until 1978 when Mikhail was appointed Secretary for Agriculture on the Central Committee. In 1980, Mikhail Gorbachev was made a full member of the Politburo under the leadership of Leonid Brezhnev. As part of the very top governing apparatus, he thought real change could be implemented to shake the Soviet Union out of the era of economic stagnation and cultural repression, but not wholesale destroy communism. Gorbachev stated, quote, They couldn't do anything. I saw that even the government ministers were helpless. So the system was really making things impossible for everyone, end quote. Two years later, Brezhnev died and was replaced by Yuri Andropov, who, as you may remember, served only 15 months before dying of kidney failure due to complications with diabetes. It wasn't quite time for Gorbachev to make his move. Andropov was replaced by Konstantin Chernenko, who died 13 months later in March of 1985. A green light for Gorbachev. Upon the news of Chernenko's death, Mikhail and Raisa took a walk outside. Hoping he was out of earshot of bugs and, the K and KGB agents, Gorbachev told her something along the lines of, I need a strange chicken wing so I can become a reader. Raisa was like, what? Mikhail said, sorry, I meant if we are to change anything, I must become leader. How did Gorbachev become general secretary? Andrei Andreevich Gromyko, chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet, who'd served as Minister of Foreign Affairs for nearly 30 years, proposed that Gorbachev be promoted general secretary. Gromyko's endorsement carried a lot of weight in the Central Committee. It would be like if you were hoping to become CEO of Apple and the ghost of Steve Jobs himself gave you an endorsement. Plus, Gorbachev's age, or lack thereof, was a huge plus since he was only 54, unlike the last three general secretaries who reeked of nursing home chicken soup and left a snail trail of piss behind their walkers. I think I just lost all my boomer audience. The Soviet people were relieved to not see another frail old man serve as a metaphor for their country. In March of 1985, Gorbachev was unanimously elected as general secretary. Damn, March was his month, man. It was clear from the beginning that Gorbachev would be a different kind of leader. He wanted to be filmed and photographed meeting the Soviet people. Raisa often accompanied Gorbachev, which was another departure from the norms of his predecessors. Let's just quickly recap here for a moment to get our bearings before we continue. Three dusty old general secretaries presided over an economically and culturally stagnant USSR and each of them died. The central problem that Gorbachev observed was stagnation of the USSR. She was unable to compete with her chief adversary, the United States. I think Gorbachev knew a different approach was needed to get the Soviet Union out of this rut. And also I think there was a vision behind what he said to his wife, if we are to change anything, I must become leader. Gorbachev's solution to stagnation was to steer the ship in a different direction rather than the insanity of trying the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. Gorbachev proposed two policies to solve this problem, perestroika, meaning restructuring, and glasnost, meaning openness or transparency. We'll get into both more in just a moment. Um, side note, one of my cousins named their cat perestroika. Weird. 
Before we discuss how Gorbachev changed the Soviet economy, we have to understand how their economy was structured. Before you venture elsewhere, this won't be an exhaustive deep dive of the Soviet economy, and I try to make this segment as exciting as possible. So here goes. Let's start with this most basic fact in life, that resources are scarce. Time, materials, coffee, your girlfriend's patience when you've spent too much time playing video games. It may, it may not seem like uh, resources are limited at times, but we live in a world of finite resources. Economics at its core deals with the management of scarce resources. How do we as individuals, communities, and societies allocate scarce resources? We also face opportunity cost. This can be tricky to wrap your head around, but basically a person cannot do two things at once, right? As an oversimplified example, suppose you can either only spend quality time with your girlfriend or spend time with your buddies. Yes, you can bring her along to hang out with your buddies, but uh, she thinks they smell funny. One hour of hanging out with your buddies costs one hour of hanging out with your girlfriend. Conversely, one, one hour of hanging out with your girlfriend costs one, anger, uh, one hour of hanging out with your ferret-scented bros. Simply put, participating in one activity means you forego the other, and that's the cost. You can quickly see how, when you apply this to the real world, things get complicated. We face many opportunity costs on a daily basis, and choosing one activity means you forego an infinite number of other activities, even listening to this podcast. There are at least 3.1 million podcasts out there, according to Listen Notes. Some sources say 5 million, which I think I believe that one a little bit more. Uh, but listening to my show costs you, you know, somewhere between 1 point or 3.1 to 5 million other shows you could be listening to. Yes, you can have multiple phones playing different podcasts, but that would make you insane. Keep opportunity cost in mind uh, going forward here. Obviously, different, eco uh, different economic theories propose their own version of a best way to manage scarcity. Different economic systems are built upon these varying theories. We can distinguish between command economies, economies, economies where the government is the principal agent of allocate, allocating scarce resource, resources, and market economies, economies where the market determines how to best allocate scarce resources based on supply and demand. Most nations' economies are somewhere in the middle, or mixed economies, including the United States. That is, the government provides some goods and services, and private enterprises provide others. The Soviet system was mostly a command economy. Generally, this means that Soviet planners managed the country's economy through a, high, uh, a highly centralized system. How did this work? Soviet-style economic planning depended on state ownership of the means of production, that is, land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Since the state owned the means of production, that meant no individual, for the most part, owned private property. Marx himself believed private property led to class struggle between those who worked on the land and those who owned it. Soviet economic planning was a specific method of centralized planning, but there were some steps along the way to develop the system. Lenin's new economic policy, which had elements of a free market economy, was deemed necessary to spur economic growth after the Civil War. These principles were largely abandoned when Joseph Stalin came to power and enacted five-year plans. The State Planning Committee, or Gosplan, was in charge of creating and implementing five-year plans. Each five-year plan had uh, or differed in its emphasis of development in different sectors like capital goods, consumer goods, communications, healthcare, welfare, etc. How is this exactly carried out? Well, based on my research, the short answer is data, math, and priorities. We'll just touch on this a bit because this is where the rubber met the road in Soviet centralized planning, but we won't go too in-depth because this isn't a calculus class. Gosplan took direction from the Communist Party's economic priorities. To meet the party's priorities, Gosplan developed what's called a system of material balances. This means that Gosplan calculated the available amounts of raw materials and inputs, such as steel or cement. Knowing what materials were available and in what quantities allowed Soviet planners to estimate achievable output. Gosplan then issued production quotas to various ministries and enterprises based on their calculations of possible production. 
There were some exceptions to this methodology, of course. Notably, the Soviet government sold and exported grain uh, obtained via collectivization to nations like the United States in exchange for industrial materials. However, Marx viewed international trade for profit as inherently exploitive. To build off this for a moment, we heard from our friend Sergei in part four that his family ended up in a Siberian penal colony for selling meat. So I guess uh, it was okay for the government to partake in trade, but not the citizenry. Uh, interesting how that uh, hypocrisy happens there. This is how the Soviet centralized system worked on a basic level. And you can probably see some of the flaws in this system. The party's priorities may not be an individual citizen's priorities. Incentives are not properly exploited. Opportunity cost, material, and labor costs may not be reflective, re reflected in prices. There's that term opportunity cost again. In this case, for Soviet planners, the cost of one ton of steel for the railway was one ton of steel for a tank. Historian Robert V. Daniels wrote, quote, The planning system as... As such was fairly simple, Gosplan calculated the sum of the country's resources and facilities, estimated priorities for their use, and handed down output targets and supply allocations to the various economic ministries and through them to every branch and enterprise in the entire economy. To be sure, this system had its limitations, including the absence of meaningful prices and cost information, and the difficulty of ex of extending planning to all the the special commodities and enterprises in a modern economy. More serious difficulties stemmed from the attitudes and priorities built into the Stalinist planning system. From the start, wrote the Soviet economist Nikolai Shmelev and Vladimir Popov, the administrative system was distinguished by economic romanticism, profound economic illiteracy, and increasing exaggeration of the real effect that the administrative factor had on economic processes and on the motivations of the public, end quote. And yes, of course, capitalism has its many flaws, most glaringly wealth inequality and market corrections like a recession. Also, I don't know if this is the case in your country, but in America, we have, in, in my opinion, an insufferable corporate culture with its own jargon like, I hope this email finds you well business solutions optimization, and other strings of meaningless nonsense. But no system is free of risk, recession, or stagnation. Hard times are just inevitable. It's like a basic law of physics. An economy goes up and comes down, because what goes up must come down. And this system, in which the party directed Goss plan to administer the, to administer the economy, was, that, was what Gorbachev inherited as general secretary. He also inherited its stagnation. Now that we are more familiar with the Soviet's economic methodology, what caused the USSR's economic stagnation? This is honestly a difficult question to answer. In economics, it is often difficult to draw perfect cause and, eff uh, cause and effect um, conclusions on, macro on the macro level and attribute all the causal factors. That said, here are some reasons we can look at that likely contributed to Soviet stagnation. Number one, the government prioritized military expenditure over consumer goods, more shells and empty shelves, opportunity cost at work. Number two, the 1973 oil crisis, too complicated to get into the details of that for now, but with respect to the Soviet Union, the oil crisis appears to have resulted in a net benefit for the oil exporter because oil supply was restricted, resulting in higher prices. But when the crisis ceased, prices dropped and that harmed Soviet economic activity. Number three, the centrally planned economic structure leading to inefficient production of certain goods and services. I have to acknowledge that one could argue over this point. Some believe that the Soviet Union was, was uh, intentionally impacted for the, worst, or for the worst by the West. Some Marxist-Leninist scholars argue that economic stagnation was the result of revisionism during the Khrushchev era. Not historical revisionism, but rather a loosening of the principles of Marxism to allow for a partial existence of the bourgeois class. 
What did Gorbachev see as a solution to the stagnation? Perestroika and Glasnost. Perestroika or restructuring was Gorbachev's economic and political restructuring to bring the Soviet Union closer to capitalist countries like Germany, Japan, and of course the US. This was accomplished by loosening some centralized planning, by allowing economic ministries more leeway, and allowing for some free market enterprise. It is important to keep in mind that Gorbachev's goal was not to eliminate the command economy, but rather make it the Soviet system more efficient. Glasnost was a slogan intended to mean increased openness and transparency of the Soviet government. Gorbachev encouraged Soviet citizens to voice their concerns and dissent regarding the very real problems that existed within the Soviet Union. He even encouraged criticism of his own regime. Some of those problems included shortages of consumer goods further exacerbated ironically by Gorbachev's economic reforms. Or perhaps this was a predictable outcome. In the short run, Perestroika led to less than desirable outcomes for the average consumer, such as higher prices and uh, decreased state support. These realities bred resentment towards Gorbachev. But let's examine the KGB's perspective on Perestroika and Glasnost and take this time to catch up with the secret police. After Yuri Andropov left his post as KGB chief, he was succeeded by Vitaly Vet uh, Fedorchuk, a Ukrainian born in 1918 and veteran of uh, the Battle of Kalkin Gaul against the Japanese. He started his secret police career as an agent of the NKVD, attached to the Red Army in Europe. Fedorchuk was replaced by Viktor Mikhailovich Chebrikov in December 1982. Chebrikov was born in Dnipro, Ukraine in April 1923. He served in a rifle regiment in the 64th Army and was wounded on the Stalingrad front. He recovered and continued to serve with 1st Ukrainian Front and sustained several more wounds including shell shock and frostbite, but his contempora contemporaries wrote that Chebrikov always returned to his duties. It's pretty badass, honestly. He continued his military career after the war and served as deputy chairman of the KGB under Andropov until Chebrikov was appointed KGB chairman by Gorbachev himself. Like Brezhnev before, Gorbachev likely came to power only at the behest of the KGB. Remember, Gorby cultivated a relationship with Andropov for years in Stavropol. And in addition to appointing Chebrikov to KGB chief, Chebrikov was also made a full Politburo member. Chebrikov was no reformist, nor does the source indicate he had any reformist tendencies. He, like the KGB as an institution, were primarily concerned or interested in the preservation of self, state, and party. Perestroika was at first meant to be limited as Gorbachev did not want to go beyond modest reforms. He needed to proceed with caution since the party and the KGB's interests were more or less indistinguishable, but both agreed that economic stagnation caused the USSR to fall behind the West. Chebrikov even publicly voiced support for Perestroika. In November 1985, during a commemoration of the Bolshevik Revolution, Chebrikov stated that he and his fellow Czechists wanted to proceed and noted the security services role in assisting the USSR in economic matters. The KGB were the sword and the shield and the eyes and the ears of the regime. They were supposed to have a real inside scoop on everything happening within the country. This will make the KGB well positioned to control information pertaining to a certain nuclear accident, but we're getting there. Chebrikov and Gorbachev's good relations ended in 1986 with the introduction of political, political reforms via Glasnost. That was a bridge too far for the KGB. They were fine with fighting corruption, but that was about it. Plus, Gorbachev's economic reforms were similar to those proposed by a previous KGB chief, Yuri Andropov. Unfortunately for Gorbachev, however, and it's difficult to determine if he knew what I'm about to say would happen or not, the KGB's distaste for Glasnost meant they also lost interest in Perestroika. But why? 
As part of Gorbachev's greater openness, the news media would be free to criticize what were supposed to be holy Soviet institutions like the KGB and investigate the conduct of their predecessor organization, the NKVD. Revealing those crimes in the Soviet press led to unsavory revelations about the KGB, which led to calls for strengthening laws against excessive law enforcement, i.e. reigning in some of the KGB's power. It seemed like Glasnost would be uh, would force the, the most legendary and secretive spy agency in history to A, have less of a free hand, and B, be more transparent. Abroad, particularly here in the West, the reception to Glasnost was positive because for the West, it meant that the USSR might change for the better from our perspective. We saw potential for a more open, perhaps capitalistic, and maybe even democratic Soviet Union. The signals that Gorbachev emanated were different from previous regimes. In November 1985, Gorbachev met U.S. President Ronald Reagan in Geneva. The two leaders held talks on their relations, defense, and the arms race. That is, the increasing number, power, and reach of nuclear weapons. But soon the Soviet government would be preoccupied with containing a deadlier enemy, one that challenged the essence of Glasnost and pushed the Soviet system into its old habits. It's April 26, 1986 in Pripyat, Ukraine, about 1.20 in the morning. A young woman lays back in an armchair. She holds a little red journal in one hand and a pen in the other, jotting down her day's events with her husband and their three-year-old. She can't sleep, but writing in the dim light helps her relax. A stovetop kettle pops and crackles as water approaches a steady boil. As she glides the pen across the paper, suddenly she hears a low rumble. The furniture lurches off the ground. She jumps to her feet and rushes to the child's room. Clutching her child, she peers out the bedroom window, but it doesn't face the direction she believes the sound came from. She rushes to the kitchen, child in her arms, and pulls the kettle off the stove. She switches on the radio. The authorities are silent. All she can do is pour herself some tea, comfort her child, and hope her husband working the night shift makes it back in one piece. She picks up her diary, frustrated to see there's only one more blank page. What I described wasn't the experience of anybody in particular, but this could have happened to anybody sauntering in their apartment the night the Chernobyl nuclear disaster unfolded. Before we get into this segment, I'm not a nuclear engineer, but I have done quite a bit of research on this topic, and I have a decent foundation in some basic sciences. We'll discuss some of what happened from a scientific and engineering perspective, then focus more on the political fallout with respect to Gorbachev's leadership and vision for the Soviet Union. And just so we're clear, there is enough Chernobyl information out there to make its own series and then some. So a lot of the scientific pieces of this are cherry-picked to paint enough of a picture, but keep things moving. I'm sure there are specifics that I missed, so I encourage you to look into the Chernobyl disaster yourself for further knowledge, and I will have sources linked in the show notes as always. So, how did things go so horribly wrong at Chernobyl? First, I think we have to talk about the building blocks of life, atoms. An atom, invisible to the eye, has three major components or particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Protons and neutrons form the nucleus of an atom, while electrons travel around the nucleus. Protons and electrons have an electrical charge. Protons are positive, and electrons are negative. Neutrons have no charge, hence neutron, or neutral. The number of protons in an atom determines the element. You know, the elements? From the periodic table you had to memorize in high school? Yeah, those elements. Take an atom of hydrogen, for example. One atom of hydrogen is one proton and one electron. One positive, one negative. Balanced. Other forms of hydrogen exist with multiple neutrons, but it is still hydrogen because it has one proton. Let's make things a bit more interesting. Atoms with two protons are helium atoms. Six protons, you got carbon. Jump up to 92 protons, 
and that's a uranium atom. As elements get heavier, that is, they accumulate more protons and neutrons, there's potential for the atom to break down naturally into a more stable into uh, into more stable forms via radioactive decay. Now, I'm going to throw in other science words here: uh, isotope and atomic mass. An isotope is a version of an atom. What the hell does that mean? Well, take uranium, for example, with its thick, voluptuous nucleus of 92 protons. Isotopes of uranium have a different number of neutrons. So one way you can think of neutrons in this context is glue. Too little glue, and the protons are more likely to break off. Too much glue, and you have glue dripping off, i.e. neutrons breaking away from the nucleus, i.e. radioactive decay. Typically, uranium in its natural state is the isotope U-238, U being short for uranium and 238 being the atomic mass. Atomic mass is approximately pl uh, protons plus neutrons. So uh, take 238, for example, okay, minus 92 protons for the um, protons in uranium. That means there are 146 neutrons in the nucleus. In, the, in uranium's natural state. Another isotope, U-235, has three fewer neutrons. Again, the number of protons stays the same at 92 when we are talking about the element uranium. Controlled fission reaction is achieved when a neutron slams into the nucleus of, an, of another atom and breaks it. That break, or fission, releases energy, heat, and releases more neutrons, which speed towards other nuclei, break them, release more neutrons, etc. It's exponential, right? So for example, one fission releases two neutrons, those fission uh, two other neutrons, then release four neutrons, two, four, eight, 16, 32, etc. It happens very fast, but in a controlled environment. Okay, so who's still awake? <laughs> I promise, I promise this is all relevant. Uh, I won't go into how exactly humans developed nuclear technology, but at a very basic level, nuclear fission is the sp splitting of atoms, intentional splitting of atoms. More specifically, splitting that ripe, juicy nucleus. Why is this important? The splitting of atoms creates tremendous amounts of energy, which, when controlled for useful purposes in reactors, can produce insane amounts of electricity. Or this energy can be released instantaneously for the effect of a mushroom cloud. The theorizing and an application of atomic energy in the Soviet Union goes back to the turn of the century. We talked about early developments in nuclear energy in part five when we talked about Soviet atomic bomb development. But the development of civilian nuclear power use was a bit different. The first nuclear power plant in the USSR was the Obninsk nuclear power plant built near Moscow in 1954. This facility was built as an experimental plant to test how it would perform in supplying power to an electrical grid. Tests were performed for about four years, which showed promising results. Subsequent plants were constructed across the Soviet Union. According to an International Atomic Energy Agency report in 1982, the Soviet Union obtained only about 6.5% of its electricity from nuclear power. I wasn't able to find a full breakdown of the USSR's energy sources, but I'm fairly confident that the USSR's number one energy source uh, were hydrocarbons. That is coal, natural gas, oil, etc. New commercial nuclear reactors were built by the Ministry of Media Machine Building on the orders of the Ministry of Energy and Electrification. Reactors are complex marvels of engineering, but expensive to design, build, maintain, and operate safely. There are several different types of reactors, like pressurized water reactors or molten salt reactors, but the basic goal is to perform a fission reaction. The basic components of a reactor are fuel, a moderator, control rods, coolant, pressure vessel, steam generator, and containment. Fuel is the fissile material like uranium or plutonium. A moderator, like water or graphite, slows down neutrons and makes continued fission chain reaction more likely. 
The pressure vessel is typically a steel container housing the core, control rods, and coolant or moderator. The steam generator is critical for electricity generation. We'll get into that in a moment. Coolant is a material used to cool the reactor because they generate a lot of heat. Containment is the housing of the whole kit and caboodle with lead, thick concrete, and whatever else keeps this monster in its place and contains radiation. Electricity generation is achieved by the immense heat generated by the fission reaction that boils water, which creates steam, and the steam turns a turbine that generates electricity. That's the gist of it. Of course, nuclear energy is not without consequence, though a relatively small amount of uranium compared to tons of coal can produce an equivalent amount of energy. Nuclear waste is an inevitable problem. Radioactive accidents and contamination lasting thousands of years are also risks that shouldn't be downplayed, not to mention the cancerous effects of radiation on the human body. I mentioned nuclear plants are expensive, and that was a problem for the Soviet Union in the midst of economic stagnation. How did they solve this problem? The answer is, make it cheap. Enter the RBMK reactor design. The type of reactor used at Chernobyl was the RBMK-1000. RBMK stands for Reaktor Bolshoi Mashnosti Kanalny in Russian, or High Powered Channel Reactor in English. 1000 means that uh, that type of RBMK has a nominal capacity of 1000 megawatts of electrical power. The core, with its graphite moderators and uranium fuel, sits in a cylindrical steel vessel, and the vessel was housed in a container 25 meters high with a width of 21 meters by 21 meters. That's 84 feet tall by about a 69 square foot width for us Americans. The core alone was the size of a house, if the house were six stories tall. The RBMK core was a vertical cylinder 8 meters high and 14 meters in diameter, made up of 2,488 graphite columns with a center circular borehole, so the fuel assemblies sit within the center of each graphite stack. Graphite was the main neutron moderator in the RBMK-1000. The fuel assembly itself were uranium oxide pellets stacked and arranged vertically in a tube of a zirconium alloy. 18 zirconium tubes were arranged in a circular pattern, and the total assembly had a diameter just wide enough to slide into the borehole of the graphite columns. This apparatus was a control rod. But of the 2,488 graphite channels, only 1,661 were fuel assembly channels. The purpose of the other channels we'll get, in, we'll, get to, we'll get to later when discussing the accident itself. The bottoms of the fuel assembly channels were connected to a pressure tube that fed the core cooled water. Notably, the RBMK had no pressure vessel, so it could be refueled while operating. That's like filling the gas tank while you're revving the engine. And if that doesn't make you cringe, I don't know what will. But that was one big advantage of the RBMK, because you didn't need to turn it off to replace a, a spent fuel assembly, which was accomplished by using a special crane-like machine that traveled above the floor, or rather on top of the reactor, that looked like somebody set square Legos in a circular pattern. The core underwent the fission reaction, which created heat, cold water was pumped up through the core to heat the uh, water to create steam. The steam funneled through other channels to increase its concentration and released at a steam generator for electricity generation. The steam then ran to a condenser for conversion back to liquid water for another cycle through the core. The RBMK had two separate steam generators and condenser assemblies. Let's jump back to the fuel assembly for a moment. The uranium oxide pellets were composed of 2% enriched uranium-235. Enriched uranium means increasing the potential of U-235 in a sample of uranium fuel. See, I told you this science stuff was important. U-235 is the best fissile uranium isotope for reactors rather than the naturally occurring U-238. However, Western reactors use 3-4% enriched uranium. Why does that matter? The low-grade enrichment of 2% is partially why graphite was used as a moderator to sustain nuclear reaction. RBMKs were cheaper to produce compared to Western water pressure reactors, and 
Because of the lower uranium enriched fuel, RBMKs were cheaper to operate over time. Remember? Make it cheap. That's not to say the Soviet Union only used RBMK reactors. On the contrary, but they were an attractive and cheaper alternative for state planners. And just a, a comment before we continue, these RBMK reactors, if you've never looked at a diagram of one, are insanely complicated. There are so many different pipes and assemblies, and they're, they're enormous. The Fukushima reactor is 17 times smaller than RBMK. Nuclear reactors are typically large, but RBMKs are beasts in and of themselves. And some reactors are much, much smaller. Who's ever heard of David Charles Hahn? If you haven't heard of David, uh, David Hahn, or colloquially known as the Radioactive Boy Scout, um, this guy tried to DIY his own reactor in the shed of his mom uh, on his mom's property in Michigan. Though he never successfully built one, the police found out what he was doing. The feds got involved, and David actually had progressed enough in his experiment that the Environmental Protection Agency spent months cleaning up a radioactive mess. David's personal life wasn't the same after with uh, the suicide of his mother, an investigation by the FBI into David's actions with the nuclear reactor. He died in September of 2016 from a drug overdose. Okay, or take, for example, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Nuclear Reactor Laboratory, where they have a small research reactor in the middle of Boston on Albany and Cross Street, operated by a 20-year-old. Yes, of course they take a rigorous examination and they are supervised. But still, the concept is hilarious to me. So for my Boston listeners who didn't know this existed, sleep well tonight. RBMK reactors, despite their size and complexity, were cost-effective for the Soviet Union. However, they carried one very significant risk. Let me explain. Water is so much more than something you just suck down from a plastic bottle. Water is one of the most dense materials. It can be liquid, solid, or gas, and useful in all three ways. It's life-giving, sometimes lots of water takes life, and crucially, Water has an incredible heat capacity. Seriously, water is one of the best materials for absorbing heat, and in nuclear reactors, it can act as both a coolant to keep the reactor from overheating, but it can also serve a dual purpose as a neutron moderator. That is, water is uh, slowing down the fission reaction, albeit it's not, a very good, it's not very good at doing that. We looked at how water is circulated through the RBMK's core to heat the, the water to generate steam, and that water, upon recycling, is pumped up against gravity. Here is the problem. As more water is converted to steam, the water level in the core decreases, and the space or void above the water level is occupied by steam and the graphite moderator, increasing reaction, creating more heat and more evaporation of the water. It's like a feedback loop, right? Less water, more reaction, more heat, less water, over and over. I think you can see the danger here. The void of steam above the water level is the positive void reactivity. In the 2019 Chernobyl series, I think they refer to this as the positive void coefficient. Simply put, less water means more reaction. Western reactors are engineered for the opposite physics. Less water, less reaction. I watched a Harvard lecture on nuclear weapons by Matthew Bunn, and I believe he commented, and I'm paraphrasing, that you'd never get away with building a nuclear reactor in the US with a positive void reactivity. No utility company in their right mind would commission the money to do so because it would never be allowed to run. This flaw contributed to the explosion on the morning of April 26, 1986. This entire six-story tangled miracle of nuclear engineering was just one of four operational units attached to the Chernobyl power plant, originally called Vladimir Lenin. The plant is located in the now abandoned town of Pripyat in the Kiev Oblast on the Pripyat River, about 100 kilometers or 62-ish miles from Kiev in Ukraine. The plant is quite close to the Ukrainian-Belarusian border. Construction on the Chernobyl plant started in 1972, and the four reactors together could produce 4,000 megawatts of electrical power. Reactor 1 was completed in 1977, number 2 was completed in 78, number 3 in 81, 
and the doomed number four reactor in 1983. Soviet planners intended to complete construction on reactors 5 and 6, but that never happened because of the accident. The Chernobyl disaster wasn't the only incident to happen at this facility. In 1982, reactor number 1 suffered a partial meltdown. KGB documents declassified in April of 2021 indicated the existence of incidents that had happened with Reactors 3 and the Doom Reactor 4 in 1984. These documents also showed that in Moscow, they knew that the Chernobyl plant was uh, particularly dangerous. In the early morning of April the 26th, 1986, Reactor Number 4 was supposed to undergo a test. They needed to know if upon loss of power to the reactor, how long the turbine would continue to spin and produce enough power to keep the water pumps running until diesel generators could take over. What does that mean exactly? We know the turbine spins from pressurized steam. Take away the steam, uh, you know, it doesn't mean that the turbine will stop spinning immediately, but rather will continue to spin at a decreasing rate. It's like when you turn a bicycle upside down and spin the wheel with your hand. You applied some force and the wheel spins, but eventually it does stop. That continuous motion is the flywheel effect. In terms of a turbine, the continued rotation should continue to produce electricity, but only for a certain amount of time. But within that time, generators should kick in to pump water to the reactor. Without water, the damn thing will eventually get too hot. It would be like leaving water on a hot stove to boil and evaporate until the kettle glows orange. Please don't try that at home, nor should you ride the line when uh, operating a nuclear reactor. The test had to be performed during reactor shutdown, and Reactor 4 failed this test three times prior. The day shift paused shutdown at 50% power for 19 hours until the night crew, led by Anatoly Dyatlov, resumed the shutdown to perform the test. But they were not properly briefed. The pause happened because there was demand for power on the grid and reactor 4 made up the difference. Let's return to the fission reaction. When uranium atoms split, they don't always break in clean halves. If the nucleus of the uranium atom were to break in half, you'd have two atoms of uh, palladium. 92 protons in a uranium atom divided by two is 46 protons, which is palladium. Because clean halves don't always happen, the reaction can yield an array of fission products depending on how many protons are clustered together after fission. Sometimes one of those products is an isotope of the noble gas xenon, specifically xenon-135, with its less voluptuous but equally alluring nucleus of 54 protons. Xenon is very good at absorbing neutrons, and too much xenon accumulation in the reactor core will kill or poison the reaction, hence the term xenon poisoning. This is important because xenon accumulation or accumulated as a result of running the reactor at 50% power for nearly the entire day. I don't know if the operators knew this would happen from experience or if it was a flaw that was not explicitly written into the operator's manual. Now, aren't you glad you learned something about fission? <laughs> at the very least, you may earn some points in bar trivia. So Dyatlov and his band of night crawlers took over control of the reactor at midnight on April the 26th and resumed shutdown of reactor 4. They brought the power down to 22% and programmed the reactor's auto mode to hold power at 22%. And real quick here, some of the fuel channels and control rods were manual and others were automatic, so RBMK could adjust itself based on a sensor system inside the core. However, the reactor's automated system was not designed to perform with xenon poisoning, so the reactor's power fell to 1%. As a general rule, you know, just in case you find yourself in this situation, you are not supposed to restart a reactor that has been poisoned by xenon gas because the core is unstable. Dyatlov was under pressure to get this test done. Apparently, if the test was not performed that evening, they had to wait an entire year before they could run it again. And considering the things that we've learned about the KGB, or, or what, that we've learned the KGB were um, capable of doing to people, I don't think I need to tell you why Dyatlov felt pressured to get this test done. So Dyatlov made the decision to extract all of the control rods. Basically, this means the rods with neutron absorbing properties were pulled out, giving the reactor more reactivity, more juice to give reactor four enough power for the test. But one source I watch said this is like applying full throttle to your car with the handbrake on. 
and extracting the control rods doesn't remove the xenon gas. They started to lose control of the reactor. The reactor was brought to 6% power, and the crew agreed to shut down the reactor using a mechanism controlled by a button called the AZ-5 or AZ-5. In Russian, it's a it's an A and then number 3-5. A Cyrillic letter that looks like a 3 is Z in Russian. Upon completion of the test, Leonid Toptunov pressed the AZ-5 button, which inserted all the control rods simultaneously. The rods displaced all the water inside the reactor, which flashed into steam which displaced the xenon gas, causing more reaction, more heat, and a surge in power, demonstrating the dangerous feedback loop of the positive void reactivity. The extreme heat started melting the core. Don't! Who would have thought a nuclear reactor would be so complicated? Reactor 4 was estimated to have spiked a power output 20 times the megawattage it was designed for, perhaps producing the power equivalent to that of all the Soviet Union's nuclear reactors combined. We prefer to call it an unrequested fission surplus. All this pent-up energy had to release somewhere, and it did. The reactor blew the 1,000-ton lid clear off, which destroyed the roof, and the explosion blasted the north-facing side of the containment building away. The lid rotated and landed back into the destroyed reactor on its side, exposing columns of twisted metal and hurling radiation into the atmosphere. Graphite columns were thrown all over the building and the ground below. Just putting your hand on one of these, uh, these uh, graphite channels, as some of the firemen did who responded to this accident, exposed themselves or it would have exposed you and these firemen exposed themselves to lethal doses of radiation this explosion was not an atomic blast but a heat and gas explosion more like a dirty bomb in a pressure cooker first responders on the scene could not have known what kind of fire they were walking into radioactive graphite scattered about the scene the taste of metal in their mouths and they won't be the only ones kept in the dark about what really happened Later that morning, many miles away in Sweden, power plant radiation detectors alerted staff to a radiation leak, but it was not from their own reactors, or from the outbreak of nuclear war, as they had speculated. Belarusia took the brunt of the radioactive cloud spewed from the dead reactor as the fire inside the core continued to burn. The residents of Pripyat were also not informed of the accident. Radios were void of reports and instead played classical music, as was the Soviet MO in an emergency. Some residents of Pripyat brought themselves and tragically their children to a railway bridge to view the fire and ionizing glow of, from the plant. They got seasoned with radioactive ash falling from the sky. The obvious but invisible killer here was radiation. Radiation is energy released in certain forms like particles or rays. Some forms are low energy or non-ionizing, like what's released by your microwave or your phone, but other forms are high energy or ionizing like x-rays. Ionizing means the ability to tear electrons away from the nucleus of an atom. Ionizing radiation comes in the form of alpha and beta particles and gamma rays. Alpha, par alpha particles compared to beta are quote unquote large, but have low velocity, whereas beta particles are smaller, but have higher velocity. Gamma rays have almost no mass, but have high velocity. Think of these three little bastards as vehicles. Alpha particles are semi-trucks, not very fast, but can cause high damage if you are hit. Beta particles are like cars, moderate speed and maneuverability. Gamma rays are like crotch rockets, small and won't cause much damage if you're hit by one, but can penetrate many spaces. Exposure to radiation depends on the amount of time you're exposed and the dose or the amount. Exposure can cause irreversible and serious health effects like radiation poisoning and cancer. These three small particles have the energy to bust through the cells of your body and damage DNA. Getting hit by an alpha particle our quantum 18 wheeler will cause the most damage to dna but can be blocked by dense materials like lead gold or feet of concrete whereas gamma rays can zip through materials but cause less damage to dna if hit the scariest thing about radiation is that it is invisible but you might taste it or hear it if you have the right equipment to measure it measuring radiation is complicated though there are different ways to measure it, like Sieverts, Rem, Röntgen, Curie, Gray. I'll post the link to a in the show notes to a great video on the measurement differences, but we won't get into that mess. For our purposes, we need to know the effects on human health 
from radiation. So the best measurement for that is sieverts. But let's make this even more intuitive. The American Cancer Society says one chest x-ray is equivalent to 0.1 millisieverts or the same amount of radiation people are exposed to naturally over 10 years. So our measurement of interest is chest x-rays. A lethal dose of radiation is somewhere around 5 to or 4 to 5 sieverts or 4,000 to 5,000 millisieverts. Uh, 1,000 millisieverts is one sievert. Uh, on the bridge of death, the bridge that those people brought their kids to, to look at the power plant fire, um, those people were exposed to five sieverts per hour. Now, if I did my math right, in one hour, they got the equivalent of 50,000 chest x-rays. It's estimated that the plant workers and firefighters received somewhere between 700 and 13,400 millisieverts or 7,000 to 1.34 uh, million chest x-rays. 7,000 to 1.34 million chest x-rays. Just to repeat that for uh, dramatic effect. I'm skeptical of that high number, to be honest, but uh, it's a lot. Enough to kill 31 people. Um, is the official death toll from the Chernobyl accident. It is likely higher with the lingering effects of radiation. Let's talk about the Soviet government's reaction to, this, uh, to the accident and the KGB's role. To an extent, the KGB's role and the government's reaction were one and the same since the KGB was the arbiter of the information coming out of Ground Zero of Chernobyl. The Soviet people were not fully informed about the scale of the disaster either. An exclusion zone of about a six-mile radius was set up, and the residents of the entire city of Pripyat were forced to evacuate in around four hours. Another 1,000 or over 1,000 buses uh, evacuated over 40,000 people from this town. When the exclusion zone radius was increased to 19 miles, approximately 60,000 more people were evacuated. You can find footage on YouTube of Pripyat newly evacuated, the fresh kill of an urban center, the slow decay initiated. People just dropped their lives thinking they'd return but never did. Traffic lights were functioning and laundry sailed in the wind. Gorbachev was told fairly early on that there was a disaster, but the full extent was not conveyed. He was fed scraps of information and didn't give a speech on the matter until nearly a month later. Before Gorbachev informed the, the world about the disaster, the Soviet government kept the world in the dark. But the fact of the matter is, sometimes it's more difficult to contain the truth than radiation, especially when that radiation literally sounded alarm bells in distant western nuclear plants. The West now had a reason to doubt the conviction of, of Glasnost because in the face of an internal disaster with wide-reaching uh, consequences, the USSR fell back on secrecy. Gorbachev, however, wasn't going to let Glasnost slip. He increased the intensity of, the, of Glasnost reform by allowing Soviet media to inform the public more about matters past and present. Like I said earlier, more information was released to the public about Stalin's crimes, People who lost loved ones in the purge found closure. Additionally, news from the British Broadcasting Corporation and Voice of America became available to the wider Soviet public in 1987. So to quickly recap, Gorbachev initiated Glasnost. The Chernobyl disaster happened. The Soviet system relied on secrecy while managing the disaster. Secrecy was the antithesis to Glasnost, so Gorbachev pressed the gas pressed the gas on glasnost got it do i think chernobyl directly contributed to the fall of the soviet union well not really but we will get to that at the end let's check in with gorbachev and see what he's up to faced with stiff resistance to change by the party apparatus and the kgb gorbachev moved to make constitutional changes that that would sever the interlock between the party and the state in an attempt to isolate the hardliners in the communist party. At this point, yes, of course, there are hardline communists, but there are other people in positions of power sympathetic to economic and political reforms. 
Gorbachev wanted to pull power away from the Politburo and put it towards the, the Soviets or the workers' councils. In 1988, Gorbachev pushed for the creation of an electoral body. The Congress of People's Deputies of the Soviet Union performed largely free elections. Once elected, members uh, then uh, elected the Supreme Soviet, and that body did most of the actual legislating. They held debates between staunch communists and liberal reformers, including Boris Yeltsin. In March and April of 1989, the first elections were held. 85% of the 2,250 delegates elected were party members, but that meant 15% of the delegates did not choose to subscribe to the party line. Gorbachev was happy with the result. And though you might be thinking, wow, 85% to the Communist Party, so what? The fact that they installed this process in the midst of economic stagnation and an international crisis is impressive. All of this process was live on television for the Soviet people, which may have been a shock to those used to restricted speech. In 1990, Gorbachev made additional overtures with the West to ramp down the Cold War, but things were not so fantastic at home. Though Gorbachev achieved political change, uh, the economy was still in the toilet. Furthermore, Soviet-aligned Warsaw Pact nations facing the double whammy of a bad economy and the newfound freedom to talk about it decided to break away from the communist system rather than improve it. Also, McDonald's opened in the Soviet Union in January 1990, and it was tasty, period. Because no Atochka. Revolutions broke out first in Poland in 1988. Uh, pardon me here, we're, we're going backwards a bit in, the, in, in time. How did this revolution unfold? Well, since non-communist parties were able to participate in elections in Poland, trade unions formed their own party and won the election in August of 1989. Also, some months before, in February 1989, just ad adding to the chaos, the Soviets completed their withdrawal from Afghanistan. You can hear more about that conflict uh, in last episode, part nine of this series. So this new governing party called Solidarity Citizens in Poland was the first non-communist party to govern Poland since the end of the Second World War. Moscow's reaction was uncharacteristic of its past actions. Remember the Budapest uprising back in episode 6 when Khrushchev sent the Red Army to crush uh, Hungary's revolution? Remember the Prague Spring in the last episode when Czechoslovakia looked as if it would break away and they got invaded by Soviet troops. Hey, 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 remember the Cold War? Well, when Poland elected their first non-communist government, the Red Army did nothing. And their inaction was crucial for the remaining Eastern dominoes to fall. Hungary held elections complete with shiny new political parties in March 1990. Soviet troops discontinued their occupation of Hungary a year later. Then Hungary opened part of their border to Austria, a Western country. Many people from East Germany took advantage of this and trekked to Austria via Hungary. Because of the migratory leak to the West, East Germany closed its borders entirely, which predictably sparked protests. But the East German government retaliated by beating and arresting protesters, which caused even more people to take to the streets and overwhelm the security apparatus. East Germany hoped to receive Soviet troops, but none came. The government then decided it would allow people to open the Berlin Wall and allow crossing in a few months' time. However, the East German press secretary mistakenly told the public that the wall would come down immediately. Crowds gathered at the border checkpoints and the guards opened the border. Citizens elsewhere along the wall took up sledgehammers, chisels, and whatever else they could to destroy the concrete and barbed wire symbol of oppression that had divided Germany for so long. The collapse of the wall took place on live television, and a young KGB officer named Vladimir Putin watched on in horror as he felt abandoned by his nation. Free elections took place across Eastern Europe, with Soviet troops either doing nothing or withdrawing from those nations altogether. Other Soviet nations voted out their communist leadership, including Estonia, Lithuania, and Georgia. The ship was taking on water, and the Soviet army did not intervene to plug the holes. In Azerbaijan, rebellions were, however, stomped out when the people overthrew their government. Ukraine saw protests in 1990, but tensions rose because Ukrainian troops fighting in various conflicts were recalled. In Tajikistan, people torched government buildings. 
yeah, this is this thing is going down fast. Now, Gorbachev may have felt like he let the freedom genie out of the bottle and there was no putting it back in. On one hand, he faced the increasing power and influence of the reformers led by Boris Yeltsin. And on the other hand, he had pissed off the communist hardliners. But in order to fend off the reformers, Gorbachev appointed more hardliners to his government, which further pissed off the reformers. And the ghost of Stalin tried to shoot Gorbachev, but nothing happened. I think he was trying to fight fires left and right with whomever suited him at the time. This political and social chaos is like the unstable RBMK, and Gorby tried to change inputs to stabilize the reaction. Of this matter, Gorbachev said, My mistake, the mistake of my associates and of myself, was that we moved too slowly on the reform of the union. A couple other things are happening here as well. Uh, sorry, this was the most difficult part to put together. Things were so complicated in the Soviet Union at this time. Okay, so we've seen different parts of the Soviet Union break off and uprisings were seeping into other regions. An initiative was launched to reduce the centralized power and economic and government to transfer power to the regions and local republics. While remaining a union, it was proposed to transform the government structure into a federation where each republic had equal say in the affairs of the nation and governed themselves independently. Almost sounds kind of like the United States. The goal was to quell the various uprisings chipping away at the periphery of the union. Simply put, we will give you more independence and you have to stay within the union and stop protesting. Please and thank you. A referendum was held in March of 1991 for the people to decide. The referendum stated, quote, Do you consider it necessary to preserve the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics as a renewed federation of equal sovereign republics, which will fully guarantee the rights and freedoms of all nationalities? Yes or no? Some regions outright boycotted the referendum. I don't know well, which ones or why. Different regions also added additional questions like Russia, for example, asking if they should have a president. 150 million cast their vote. 75% voted in favor of turning the Soviet Union into a federation. In June of 1991, Boris Yeltsin was elected Russia's first president. And in August 1991, the USSR was to rebrand from the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics into the Union of Sovereign States. Between Gorbachev's runaway reforms and changing the country's sign on the door, the hardliners collectively threw up all over the Kremlin. Outside, inside, didn't matter. Just a cathartic heave to expel the democracy, ulcerating their stomach linings. Particularly the head of the KGB in 1991, Vladimir Kryuchkov. He ordered the KGB to put Boris Yeltsin under surveillance, and Gorbachev was put in their crosshairs. The August 1991 coup was led by high-ranking Communist Party leaders, including KGB chief uh, Kryuchkov and Vice President Gennady Yaniyev. They grabbed their hammers and sickles and did the coup. Their goal was to remove Gorbachev, use the Red Army to hold the country together, and return power back to Moscow. Gorbachev was on vacation in Crimea when the hardliners launched their coup. Gorby's house was surrounded by agents, and communication lines were cut off. I think it went down something like this. Who are you? My name is Vladimir Futinov, the KGB's one and only shock puppet secret agent. Listen here, Pookie. You gone too far and destroyed a glorious nation. You better put pen to paper and resign effective immediately. You hear me, Pookie? Resign. No, I cannot do that. You and your birthmark make things real difficult, don't you? In that case, let me motivate you with the prospect of a nightmare vacation to one of our fun torture chambers. In Moscow, tanks rolled on the streets and protesters climbed them like ants on discarded fruit. The Soviet people were told on TV that Gorbachev was on vacation and undergoing treatment. They didn't specify for what and that Gorby was tired after all these years. Non-Communist Party leaders were arrested except for Boris Yeltsin. It would have been reasonable for reformists and Gorbachev to assume 
once the coup doers obtained power, they'd go on a purge since most of the KGB was with them and some of the military since the defense minister, Dmitry Yazov, was also in on the plot, hence the tanks in the street. Gorby and friends probably thought they were a word that starts with F and ends with U C K. Fortunately, they were not fire trucked because there was a rift in the military since most of the top brass and the Red Air Force did not agree with the coup. The Red Air Force was based. The part of the military that didn't agree with the coup and some civilians and Yeltsin barricaded the house of the government of the Russian Federation or the White House, as it's called. Yeah, it's called the White House. Western leaders opposed the coup. And other communist nations like Cuba, North Korea, and China supported the coup. Nice crowd. It was by day two, the committee consisting of Dumb and Dumber, aka Yanalyev and Kryuchkov, realized they'd fire trucked up. Isolated skirmishes between coup troops and Yeltsin's people broke out along the barricade, but Yeltsin held off the assault. By day three, some plotters noped out of Moscow. Boris Pugo, the interior minister, shot himself. <laughs> Others went to beg for forgiveness from Gorby's merciful birthmark that they would not be purged once he resumed power. The remaining plotters were imprisoned, the military withdrew from Moscow, and the common people resisted the last gasp of the Communist Party to return to full strength. This was the death knell of the Communist Party. Shortly after the end of the coup, crowds gathered around the Lubyanka building, the KGB's headquarters, first occupied by the Cheka. The crowd tore down the statue of Felix Dzerzhinsky, remember him, old Iron Felix from episode 3, the leader of Lenin's Cheka, a symbol of secret police rejected. Between August 1991 through to December 1991, each republic of the Soviet Union declared independence, including Russia, on December the 12th of 1991. The hammer and sickle flag was lowered on the evening of December 25th, 1991 and replaced with the horizontal stripes of red, white, and blue. There are several different historical interpretations of the tricolor flag dating back to the Tsarist era. To be honest with you guys, this was difficult to pin down for some reason. I asked Eastern Europeans, Russians, I put the question to Instagram, did some digging on my own, and historians all agree that the colors are red for the blood spilled while drinking vodka, blue for the water spilled while making vodka, and white for the clarity of the vodka. No, of course that's not what, it, what the colors mean. Uh, s still, this, this was surprisingly difficult to figure out. Different people I asked had different interpretations, and the internet had some variations on its history. The Grand Duchy of Moscow, the Tsars, and of course the Soviets donned different flags like the double-headed eagle or the hammer and sickle. Best I could find is that the tricolor flag comes from 1693 when Peter the Great ordered a ship from the Dutch, whose flag shows horizontal stripes of red, white, and blue. Peter decided to model the flags uh, or model the Russian Navy's flag on the Dutch flag by reordering the colors to white, blue, and red. One interpretation of the colors is red for military glory, white for prosperity, and blue for hope. Another interpretation is white for peace and cleanliness, blue for the sky and faithfulness, red for courage and heroism. Again, your interpretation may vary. On December the 26th, 1991, the Soviet Union died. The nation Vladimir Lenin bore out of revolution from the ashes of anarchy and czarist rule back in episode three a nation that transformed from an agrarian backwater to a global superpower. A nation that by its ideals set out to achieve a classless society and fell adjacent to short into a horror show of repression and secret police. But for their flaws and the lives lost, the achievements shouldn't be discounted. Bloody was their contribution to defeating Hitler. They progressed in the sciences and exported a culture that many of us are fascinated by today. The old Soviet mosaics in Eastern Europe, music, propaganda art, and a whole host of Russian tropes. For me, personally, the Soviet Union is a mixed bag, but I'm going to save what I've learned for the very end of this entire series. We have a few more things to wrap up. 
Gorbachev gave one last speech expressing sorrow for his mistakes and resigned his post as general secretary, the very job Joseph Stalin was assigned. What happened to the Communist Party? Boris Yeltsin banned them in 1991. Yeltsin also subscribed to the Secret Police podcast. What happened to the KGB? That final form of the Cheka? They suffered death by bureaucratic decree. In November of 1991, Boris Yeltsin transformed the Cheka into the Federal Security Agency, or AFB. In January 1992, a decree was ordered to create the Ministry of Security of the Russian Federation and abolished the previous Federal Security Agency and remnants of any inter-Soviet Republic security links. December 21st, 1993, by decree, the Ministry of Security of the Russian Federation was abolished and the Federal Counterintelligence Service of the Russian Federation, or FSK, was created. Even though the Soviet Union was no more, the familiar branding and rebranding of the same security services occurred. No matter how many times you shuffle the cards, it's the same deck. Not shuffled in the orientation of the Oprichniki or the Cheka, but a modern twist of Russian secret police that will become today's FSB. What happened to Gorbachev? Gorbachev remained politically active post-general secretary. He gave numerous interviews, wrote books, and appeared in different types of media. We'll get into that in a moment, as well as Gorbachev's controversial status. He is the first Russian leader we have talked about that has provided such intimate accounts into his life and career. Perhaps the next closest accounts are from Khrushchev's own memoirs that he recorded in retirement. But Gorbachev obviously survived to see incredible changes in media technology such as the internet and social media. After resigning as general secretary, Gorbachev took the opportunity to spend more time with his wife, Raisa, and his family. He founded the International Foundation for Socioeconomic and Political Studies, colloquially called the Gorbachev Foundation, or as I call it, the Gorby Foundation. Gorby Foundation researches the perestroika era and current issues affecting Russia. Raisa herself was also active in campaigning for children's charities and advocating for women's welfare in Russia. Foundations need money, and there is controversy here. Gorbachev charged speaking fees to give lectures to an international audience. Okay, fine, who doesn't like money? He toured the U.S. in a private jet provided by Forbes and uh, the American Business Magazine for, uh, for one of his tours, at least one of them. He also visited President Reagan and his family. Gorbachev published nearly 20 books, including his memoirs, and collected sales revenue for those. He also appeared in TV ads, including his famous Pizza Hut ad, as well as ads for Apple computers, Louis Vuitton, and Austrian Federal Railways, or O Umlaut BB, as in Bravo. From my research, it looks like some people are upset by Gorbachev taking money from corporations or corporations taking advantage of Gorbachev for what he symbolizes to a Western audience. Let's focus on the Pizza Hut commercial for a moment. I found a YouTube video from the channel uh, called SideQuests. I didn't watch any of their other videos, but at least in their video titled How to Get Rich by Destroying the USSR, it has an anti-capitalist scent to it. I'll play the audio of the Pizza Hut ad. Um, if you haven't seen it, I recommend watching it yourself. Then I'll react to some of the comments in this video. Okay, looks like we are in Red Square, St. Basil's Cathedral, Basil, whatever. Gorbachev with the umbrella walks into the Pizza Hut. Okay, so this family sees him sit down, and this boomer says, that's Gorbachev. And then this kid says, okay, so the guy says, because of him, we have economic confusion. And the kid says, because of him, we have opportunity. Because of him... We have political instability. Because of him, we have freedom. Complete chaos. Hope. Political instability. And then this babushka inter, uh, inter, uh, interjects and she says, because of him, we have Pizza Hut. And they kind of agree. Hey, Grandpa stands up and says, Hail Gorbachev, or Hail to Gorbachev. Sometimes nothing brings people together like a nice hot pizza from Pizza Hut. Uh, now I want pizza. Another babushka. Moscow in the middle of February. Great friends, great pizza. 
Okay, so that was the Pizza Hut ad, and now I'm just going through some of the comments from the video from SideQuest called How to Get Rich After Destroying the USSR. So some of these comments are, let's see, somebody said, Gorbachev basically being an advertisement supermodel for companies trying to get into the Eastern market and is both surprising and not surprising at all. Somebody said, I thought you were going to talk about how the oligarchs pillaged the rest of the Soviet economy, but it's okay. Another comment says, I thought this video would cover how Western companies and the West in general made bank on the dissolution of the USSR. One more comment here is, it says, uh, when a ruler of a nation has to look for work once they retire, you know things are bad. That's actually a good point since the general secretaries usually died in office, so I don't know how Gorbachev was paid after he retired from a state that no longer existed. A criticism of Gorbachev I've heard often is that he sold out to the West. A few things with the, with the ad, um, it definitely captures the sentiments between older boomer Russians versus younger Russians at the, at least at the time that the ad was aired in 1998. Also, there was no pizza hut in the middle of red square and the shop that plays the Pizza Hut is a jewelry store. Moving on. Despite Gorbachev promising not to criticize Yeltsin, he did anyway. In fact, in 1996, Gorbachev actually ran for president of Russia, but received about 0.5% of the vote. Kind of funny because in the video, there is a comment that says, everybody in this Pizza Hut yelling, Hail Gorbachev, are probably the 0.5% of people who actually voted for him. Gorbachev was hit with tragedy in the summer of 1999 when Raisa was diagnosed with leukemia, cancer of the blood. She was treated with chemotherapy but slipped into a coma in September and died shortly thereafter. His lifelong partner, the woman who'd showed the country boy from Stavropol how to be a Moscovite, who stood with Mikhail side by side through all the turmoil, departed the earth. Gorbachev wrote in his memoir of her death, I had never felt so lonely in my life. I hope we will meet again. We were happy together. Russian politics came crashing through the door once again. Yeltsin, who we will talk about more next episode, resigned and was succeeded by Vladimir Putin, who then won the 2000 presidential election. Gorbachev attended Putin's inauguration ceremony and felt Putin was the right man for the time as a counter in style to Yeltsin. We'll talk much more about Putin next episode as well. Through the early 2000s, Gorbachev helped form and merge new Russian political parties. He was critical of any sense of hostility from the U.S. towards Putin, spoke out against NATO uh, operations in Yugoslavia, objected to nations that previously broke, broke away from the Soviet Union, then joining NATO. He criticized the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq, attended President Ronald Reagan's state funeral, and visited New Orleans in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Gorbachev spoke against U.S. support for the Georgian president, uh, Mikhail uh, Saakashvili, during the Russo-Georgian War in 2008, seeing the U.S. Uh, absorb the Caucasus into its sphere of influence at that time. Because of uh, consecutive term limits, Putin was temporarily, temporarily succeeded by Dmitry uh, Medvedev in 2008. Gorbachev criticized the rigged 2011 parliamentary elections. He saw that they were rigged by the then and now governing party United Russia. When Putin was re-elected in 2012, Gorbachev started to sweat and saw United Russia as, quote, embodying the worst bureaucratic features of the Soviet Communist Party, end quote. In 2014, Gorbachev defended uh, Crimea's annexation by Russia and criticized Western sanctions placed on Russia after the invasion of Ukraine. In November of 2014, he attended the 25th anniversary of, of the destruction of the Berlin Wall. He stated that ongoing conflict in Donbass would lead to a new Cold War. In 2018, when former President George H.W. Bush died, Gorbachev remembered the former president fondly and noted that their cooperation led to the end of the Cold War. Now we arrive at current events. When Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022, Gorbachev personally made no comment, but his foundation stated, and I'm paraphrasing, that hostilities should cease immediately and enter negotiations. 
But close friends of Gorbachev stated that privately he was distraught that Putin would make such a move because Gorbachev believed that it basically blew up his life's work. Gorbachev struggled with some unspecified illness as well as diabetes and cataracts. He had spinal surgery in Germany and a pacemaker installed in a separate surgery. Mikhail Gorbachev, the farm boy from Stavropol who saw Stalin's purges, pushed his way through the party apparatus and helped end the Cold War, died at the age of 91 in Moscow just last August the 30th, 2022. Let's recap. Mikhail Gorbachev was born in Provolny in the Stavropol region of Russia in 1931. His family and many others he knew suffered at the hands of Stalin's purges. His grandfather was beaten and abused by the secret police. He attended law school in Moscow and met his wife, Raisa, who showed him how to be an urban fellow. Gorbachev stood up to the system when his Jewish friend in Moscow nearly got caught up in the doctor's plot. He had a keen sense of right and wrong to his detriment. Gorbachev rose through the party ranks in the Stavropol region and cultivated a powerful network, including the likes of KGB chief Yuri Andropov. Gorbachev moved back to Moscow to take his post as Secretary of Agriculture on the Central Committee. He recognized that serious change needed to be done to correct economic stagnation that Leonid Brezhnev seemed unable or unwilling to, con to correct. Gorbachev bided his time to make the leap to general secretary as Brezhnev, then Andropov, then Chernenko died in office. Gorbachev was appointed general secretary partly because, at the time, he was a young man. He introduced first perestroika, or economic reforms, which the party elites, including the KGB, agreed were necessary. But the next reforms, glasnost were, or openness, were too much. Plans changed when the Chernobyl nuclear disaster forced the system to embrace the familiar secrecy. Gorbachev hit the gas on Glasnost and introduced an electoral body to help remove the party's uh, white-knuckle grip on the Soviet steering wheel. This was likely an overcorrection on his part because, with the introduction of new parties, nations that belonged to the Union held their own elections and booted the Communist Party's then later broke away from the Union altogether. The KGB and other party elites launched a last-ditch effort to hold power by trapping both Gorbachev at home and Yeltsin in a government building. The coup failed because it had neither popular support nor the full support of the military. The USSR ceased to exist officially on December the 26th, 1991, and the KGB was bureaucratically written out of existence, like Thanos snapping his fingers, or rather, Yeltsin signing a document. In my opinion, Chernobyl didn't cause the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it didn't help. I think between the trajectory that Gorbachev put the nation on, and people's thirst for freedom, these things would have dissolved the Soviet Union on its own. Chernobyl just accelerated the inevitable. What happened to Chernobyl? A concrete sarcophagus was constructed over the open reactor in November of 1986. In 2015, a new steel superstructure, the largest movable structure in the world, was carefully slid over the old sarcophagus. This new structure is fitted with uh, machinery that can be remotely controlled to dispose of the old sarcophagus and dismantle the reactor. The project has been delayed due to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The miniseries Chernobyl was released in the summer of 2019 and was an instant hit in the West. Russia banned the series, like they did with the death of Stalin, calling it propaganda. The Chernobyl series sparked a wave of tourism to the Chernobyl exclusion zone, particularly by infuriating Instagram influences showing their asses next to dilapidated buildings or putting their hands on highly radioactive mechanical claws. An estimated 2,000 people per day visited the exclusion zone in the months following the series' premiere. Tourists leave trash, move, and even steal objects that could be radioactive. Other people, called stalkers, illegally trespass on the, on the exclusion zone to help restore things that are vandalized or broken. RBMK reactors are still used inside Russia today. In December of 1986, Cleanup crews discovered an inanimate horror in the dark maintenance corridor beneath reactor number four. A solid mass of molten corium, that is uranium, concrete, zirconium, graphite, and whatever else melted inside the reactor, 
burned through the bottom floors until it came to rest where it was discovered. It's like a real-life SCP, dubbed the elephant's foot because of its resemblance to an elephant's foot. This blob of solid corium is highly radioactive, but thankfully contained. At the time of its discovery, the elephant's foot gave 8,000 to 10,000 rentgen per hour. That's 114 sieverts or 1.14 million chest x-rays per hour. In 1996, deputy director of the new safe confinement project, Artur Korneyev, snapped a photo of the mass. It was so radioactive that the photograph is distorted by what looks like a bolt of lightning seared across the image. In 2021, the elephant's foot is cracking and appears to have the consistency of sand. Before the war, the abandoned and overgrown city of Pripyat was a destination for adventure tourists wanting to see a place frozen in time. People have claimed to see mutants running around the place. A horror film called The Chernobyl Diaries, released in 2012, depicts such a thing. I said at the beginning that Gorbachev was a controversial figure, but why? Well, it really depends on who you ask. Many Westerners have a positive view of him as the guy who helped end the Cold War and embraced the West. Some Eastern Europeans from countries that first broke away from the USSR hold a similar view. Many Russians despise him. But again, it depends on who you ask. I can't describe the level of nuance here, but I can tell you a story. Um, back in early 2020, a friend of mine from Moscow, who I've known since 2007 when we met as kids, uh, visited us in Minneapolis. I remember one night we gathered for dinner for American-style pizza, as I recall, and Gorbachev came up in conversation. I remember my friend uh, scoffed when, <laughs> when we mentioned his name. Uh, when I asked his opinion, he described to me a view that is shared by many Russians that Gorbachev destroyed what they knew. For some, it wasn't just a culture or political system Gorbachev destroyed, but their livelihoods. Russia was not a good place to be in the 90s. And don't worry, we will get into the oligarchy next episode. But my understanding is there is a view that Gorbachev opened the door to a wave of Westernism. Now, to that I would say, if the Soviet system was that resilient, it would have not collapsed with the introduction of new political parties or economic reform. That to me says the system was flawed. But let's go further. Remove Gorbachev or somebody like him from the equation, and I think the Soviet Union would have continued until somebody else made a major course correction. There are a few things I'd say to this. Um, one is I think that the Soviet Union's T-2 collapse started with Stalin's death. By an iron fist, ruthless secret police, and terrifying consequences if you dared rock the boat, the Soviet Union was best able to exist. I will say, though, Stalin was lucky because he came to power at a time of great technological change where the Soviet Union, with the right management, could make the leap from hand plows to plutonium bombs. Let's also look at the Eastern European perspective. The dissolution of the Soviet Union meant no more repression from Moscow, a weakened Russia, and a chance for their nation to take charge of its own destiny and exercise some agency in how to live without the threat of Soviet troops kicking in the door. A chance to experiment with democracy and trade with the West. Do I think Gorbachev intended to collapse the Soviet Union? Honestly, no. But if I may use pilot terminology, I think he went to correct a stall and sent the aircraft into a tailspin, and one he could not recover from. Gorbachev is a great example of the blind man and an elephant parable. You've got different people touching different parts of the same thing and concluding it's a different object entirely based on their experience. But I'm just a dumb, coffee-drinking, gun-toting American with my limited American view on a part of the world I've never visited. Yes, I do own a pair of cowboy boots. So I'm more than happy to have a conversation about this. DM me on the socials. I guess the only other coffee-drinking, dumb American thing I'd want to say to this is, in learning more about Glasnost, I'll just leave you with this question. Did the Soviet people, for some reason, deserve lack of transparency from their government? So anyway, if you do message me on the socials saying something rude or obnoxious or otherwise something from the depraved mind of a chronically online isolated whack nut, then I won't even entertain that. 
My point is Gorbachev is controversial and he made mistakes that ended up really sucking for some people and being really awesome for others. We're going to find out how and why next episode. What's for damn sure is that despite the death of the KGB, something else rose from the ashes, a modern force with a mind in the past and powers in the present. Next time on Secret Police, Boris Yeltsin takes control of a weakened Russia and floundering economy. He will drunkenly stumble from power and leave the reins to his deputy Vladimir Putin, a former KGB agent himself, who leads a band of modern agents known as the Federal Security Services, or the FSB. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you so much to all who have liked and shared my podcast. Special thanks to the agents on Patreon. Don't collapse an entire country accidentally or intentionally. And please don't mess with nuclear fission at home. Agents dismissed. Mark, make things real difficult, don't you?